There's nothing quite like a royal wedding. It brings the country together and attracts the eyes of the world. But the royal wedding that set the trend was in 1947, when Princess Elizabeth married Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten. It had to be a love match. How could you not love this gorgeous creature? Britain had never seen anything like it. There was Hollywood suddenly come to London. It entranced the nation. The congregation could virtually hear a pin drop. But outside, you hear the nation going bananas. And brought new hope to a battered post-war Britain. In this film, with access to the Queen's private home movies. I've never seen these shots before. And revealing insights from palace insiders. I think it must have been the king who led the Congo line. We were all part of it. If there's a Congo line, you join it. The princess used a pink lipstick known as Balmoral and did her own makeup. I shall say no more. We will bring the royal wedding to life. From the engagement ring, not wanting to be vulgar, but uh, what exactly have I got here? To the spectacular wedding dress. Have you still got the pattern? Yes. That's the Queen's dress. That's amazing. <laughs> From the bride's bouquet. I think I might get you to be my Princess Elizabeth standing. To the nine foot high, 500 pound wedding cake. It's just a series of heart and man <laughs> moments. We will show how the wedding of the century was pulled off against the odds. In 1947, Britain was cold, hungry and miserable. The nation needed a morale boost like no other. And with the royal wedding, that is exactly what it got. But this wasn't just the marriage of a beautiful princess and her dashing prince. This was the people's wedding. On the morning of the 20th of November, the moment Britain and the rest of the world had been waiting for finally arrived. At 11.16am, the Irish state coach carrying the bride, Princess Elizabeth, and her father, King George VI, set off for Westminster Abbey. The country hadn't experienced such pomp and pageantry since before the war, and the sight was breathtaking. The crowds were enormous, and the noise they made. There was an enormous feeling of some great event going on. In London, hundreds of thousands took to the streets. Across the globe, 200 million listened to the radio broadcast. And a lucky few even watched on that newfangled invention, television. At 11.28, Right on time, the bride and her father arrived at the west door of Westminster Abbey. The wedding of the century was about to begin. The best thing that had ever happened, the lovely princess has found her prince. Philip and Elizabeth's engagement was announced on the 9th of July, 1947. She was just 21 and he was five years her senior. The public reaction to the news was ecstatic. Although little did they know, the couple had probably been engaged in private for the best part of a year. They didn't go out publicly very much. But I think it was so clever because nobody seemed to know anything and they announced their engagement and the press got a great shock, I think, there because they went on to it. The couple's friendship blossomed during the war. When on leave from the Royal Navy, Philip sometimes stayed at Windsor Castle, where he saw another side to the young Elizabeth. Her starring role in the 1943 Christmas panto Aladdin, revealed in these rare photographs, particularly caught his eye. She was never shy. She was full, full of fun. Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret were very good actors, actresses or actors. And um, he certainly was at one of those performances. And I think he obviously was very attracted to her. 
When he was overseas, Elizabeth stayed in touch with her handsome young sailor and even had a favourite photograph of him on her bedroom wall. And once Philip stepped into the limelight, it was clear that he wasn't just Elizabeth's pin-up. Schoolgirls up and down the country were transfixed by the charming prince. I was very envious of Princess Elizabeth when she married Philip because he was such a dish, you know, and he really was so good-looking. Suddenly this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous naval officer turned up. He was the first man that one thought, gosh, this is a very attractive man. I really feel attracted to this lovely, lovely man. Here you were, aged 14, and then suddenly this wedding was announced. Yes. How was that for everybody? Well, we were all film star fans mm. at school. We all loved our Betty Grables and Betty Huttons. And all of a sudden, this um, rather beautiful princess comes into our lives. I was very big on scrapbooks. I kept scrapbooks of all my movie stars. I had huge books of pictures cut out of magazines. And I was so fascinated, I started a scrapbook on the wedding of Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip. So what went into the scrapbook? What were the Everything, things? starting from the gossip about them going out. This was one of the pictures that I had in my scrapbook. It's pure Hollywood, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So here was this glamorous princess suddenly catching everyone's eye. Well, it wasn't her that caught her eye. It was Prince Philip. <laughs> I was going to say yeah. that. Yeah. We all thought he was a Greek god. He was very, very good looking. So he had the sort of film star good looks. Yes, he did. And obviously he was mad about her as well. Yeah. Even as a schoolgirl, I could yeah. see that there was this huge kind of love which we'd only seen in the movies. Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten was pretty much the ideal suitor, blessed with blue blood, good looks and charm. The one thing he didn't have, however, was the bank balance to buy an engagement ring fit for a princess. At least not this princess, who was set one day to inherit one of the world's finest jewellery collections. And so, his solution lay in embracing the spirit of austerity with a spot of royal recycling. The jewellery firm that made Elizabeth's ring was later taken over by George Pragnall and is now run by his grandson, Charlie. We can show you how the ring would have been made 70 years ago using a traditional goldsmith's bench and by hand. The stone that was used in the Queen's engagement ring came from Philip's mother's tiara. So this is interesting. I didn't realise that. I feel rather sorry for Philip's mother, who's had to sacrifice his beautiful tiara. Well, it was absolutely commonplace throughout, certainly, European royalty to be reusing family stones in jewellery that was more fashionable of the day. So tell me about the design of the ring. It was a very understated and simple design yeah. with a deco inspiration. It also shows that Philip knew that the princess would like a ring that she could wear all the time, which was a relatively contemporary approach to jewellery, to, because a lot of jewellery was only worn in the evenings in those days. So we've got these diamonds that have come from Philip's mother's tiara. Yes. Let's talk about those. What, 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 what were they? Well, they were very fine diamonds. Mm -hmm. The diamond that was used is approximately three carats, which is that sort of size, right. which is a very nice size for an engagement ring. But for a princess, that's relatively modest. Some of the diamonds that were in the tiara are a lot larger. So he had a choice of exactly what size. I see. So he went for something seemly, not too flash. Quite, quite. And bearing in mind the time just after the war, there was a necessity in a degree uh, every of day, a propriety in what should be an everyday ring. I'm see. sure that had an, an effect on the decisions. That is beautiful. The ring features a brilliant cut diamond set in platinum, flanked on each side by five smaller diamonds. But there's just one question I think we all want to know the answer to. So, Charlie, you're not wanting to be vulgar, but uh, what exactly have I got here? A very high quality three carat diamond is approaching six figures, if not more. Okay. Very nice. 
In the grim, grey world of post-war Britain, the royal wedding promised some much-needed glitz and glamour. But with clothes and food still on the ration, how would the bride lay her hands on a wedding dress or a wedding cake? And how would a virtually bankrupt country pay for a right royal wedding? In July 1947, crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace to cheer the news of Princess Elizabeth's engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten. But as the wedding planning began, it wasn't clear that the country could afford a lavish celebration. Although the war was over, life in Britain wasn't getting any easier. With hundreds of thousands of homes still in ruins, Actress Sheila Hancock grew up in South London, where she'd experienced the very worst of the Blitz. We were what was known as Bomb Alley. We were bombed quite a bit. I mean, in the end, my, my dad stopped trying to repair anything, and I remember we just had tarpauling over the roof. But I was scared. My memories of my childhood are one of fear, to be honest. Rationing remained in force, and food was in even shorter supply than it had been during the war. Author Jilly Cooper was 10 at the time and well remembers the grim post-war years. The country was so low and so cold and so depressed, even though we'd won a war, we were very, very short. One used to make one's boiled egg, one boiled egg lost for hours and hours and hours and hours. It was very, very austere. In Parliament, some members of the Labour government opposed an extravagant royal wedding. Britain, they said, was virtually bankrupt. So perhaps it was best to forget the pomp and pageantry and have a small private ceremony at Windsor. But others knew the wedding was one of the few things the country had to look forward to. When he heard news of the engagement, Winston Churchill described the prospect of a royal wedding as a flash of colour on the hard road we have to travel. He saw that this was a fairy tale story to capture the hearts of a nation, a nation desperate for some good news. And the British people agreed. Through the nation's darkest hour, the king and queen had stood shoulder to shoulder with their subjects, earning their respect and loyalty. I admired the royal family. Somebody asked the Queen, will you evacuate the princesses? And she said, no, because uh, they won't go without me and I won't go without the King. During all the bombing, they were at Windsor. And that was a tremendous example. And the bride-to-be had also done her bit for the war effort, serving in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. It was known that Princess Elizabeth was in the ATS and there were pictures of her fiddling around with engines. And it just felt that they were fighting it along with us, you know? Um, and that did give everybody a lot of strength. The huge crowds that greeted the princess and her fiancé confirmed that the public had completely bought into the royal romance. I am so happy that on this my third visit, my future husband is by my side. So this had to be a wedding to do the whole country proud. I can't imagine that anybody was miserable enough to say, yeah, she, could, she should get married in her ATS uniform or something like that. And I think they probably did feel grateful, as my parents did, of the way the, the royal family behaved during the war. I think they thought they deserved a good knees up for their daughter's wedding. With the wedding date set for the 20th of November, there were just four months to prepare. It looked as if Buckingham Palace would have its work cut out. But then something extraordinary happened. From every corner of the country, the palace was inundated with offers of help as the nation set to work growing, sewing and baking for their princess. This was set to be the people's wedding. Their first chance to pitch in came with the item at the top of every bride's to-do list, the dress. 
Women around the country knew that the princess needed a wedding dress and clothing was on ration. So what they did was they sent in their clothing coupons. That's amazing. These women who had nothing are sending in their coupons to the palace. And 3,000 clothing coupons were received by the palace. It was a generous gesture, but using someone else's coupons was illegal. So Buckingham Palace had to return them all and insist that the princess would use her own allowance to buy the material. Yes. But then, shock, horror. Rumours spread that the fabric for the dress had been spun by silkworms from Britain's wartime enemy, Japan. Questions about these rogue worms were even raised in Parliament. But when the worm's true national identity was revealed, there was relief all round. It was very important that the silkworms were good, patriotic Chinese silkworms, because China had been on our side in the past war, whereas nasty enemy silkworms were not allowed to touch the dress, so we were all much reassured about the silkworms. <laughs> The silk from the nice, friendly Chinese silkworms was woven at the Winterthur factory in Dunfermline, Scotland. Work was shrouded in secrecy, so 19-year-old weaver Barbara Unwin had no idea what the silk would be used for. I just knew it was for something special, but what? It could have been anything. I never thought about us being special, getting picked, you know. You had a job and you got on with it. But it was when I think back... It's the only special thing that ever happened in my life, really, apart from getting married and having a family. And they checked every bit of it to make sure there was no flaws in the material and there wasn't. It must have been all right, otherwise I would have known about it. <laughs> I'd have been told. Barbara only found out just how special the silk was when she received a surprise in the post, an invitation to the royal wedding. There was one question Barbara and the rest of the world wanted the answer to. What would the wedding dress look like? In 1947, this building here was home to the studio of designer Norman Hartnell, who was making Princess Elizabeth's wedding dress. Now, all the journalists who are sniffing around here knew that if they could get even just a glimpse of the new wedding dress, they would land themselves the biggest scoop of the entire royal wedding. Hartnell was having none of it. He was determined that his creation must remain an absolute secret. So he had all of his windows whitewashed. He even got his manager to spend every night here, allegedly with a gun, keeping watch over the world's most famous dress. Norman Hartnell specialized in glamorous frocks for aristocrats and actresses. But this was the biggest challenge of his career. There you are, you see? Well, it's quite a simple line, but a, a rather elaborate working. Hartnell went all out with the dress, which featured no fewer than 10,000 seed pearls. It was said to have cost a small fortune, the equivalent of over 30,000 pounds in today's money. In 1947, Author Antonia Fraser was a 14-year-old schoolgirl. I was obsessed, like most girls of my age, with the dress, what it was going to be like, the details. You know, it brought light into our lives, which I now see were pretty dreary. One of the lucky few to be let in on the secret of Hartnell's design was seamstress Betty Foster. Well, this must bring back memories for you. It really does, yes. When you were last yes. here? Oh, I left Hartnell's in 1950. It was all very glamorous. Yeah. I remember it being very glamorous. So, Betty, this is your scrapbook. What have you got in here? Well, I've got a picture of the workroom where the wedding oh. dress was made. In Mademoiselle David's workroom? Mademoiselle did all the fittings, but we had to make the dress. Look at this person with a blue halo, and it says me. <laughs> yes. How old were you when, uh, when you were working on the wedding dress? 19. That was Miss Holiday. She was a senior hand. She was in charge. Norman Hartnell asked, would you make Princess Elizabeth's wedding dress? And she'd done all the royal dresses, 
all the important dresses. Yeah. But she was a bit hesitant. I'm not surprised. And Miss Holiday said to me, Betty, I want you to make the buttons. And I'd never sewn buttons. I'd never had occasion to sew buttonholes. And wow. so I had to practice. I had to sit by myself. And she said, nobody's to talk to Betty. So have you, have you still got the pattern? Yes. Have you really? Yes, I have. In here. That's incredible. Have you, have you made it for anyone else? Yes. <laughs> yes, and I've made it for myself, my daughters. <laughs> it's a it's a basic pattern really. you work from there. Yeah. It's but still it's the Queen's dress, that's amazing. <laughs> it was really breathtaking. It was the embroidery, it was so beautiful. I was so privileged to have been able to work on it. Yeah. When I saw the Queen, where well, she was Princess Elizabeth, in the carriage mm. with her dad, the king, mm. wearing it, I had quite a good view of it. It looked more beautiful when she was wearing it. It looked magical. I felt so proud to sit there and think, I helped make that dress. The dress was a very unusual silhouette at that time. It was the cutting edge of fashion. It set the scene for wedding dresses into the 21st century. Most recently, the Duchess of Cambridge's wedding dress. The embellishment, the seed pearl work, the very fitted sleeves, those really came about because of Sir Norman Hartnell. Meanwhile, another equally spectacular creation was taking shape. The bakers of McVitie's were hard at work on the monumental wedding cake. With less than four months to prepare for the wedding of the century, anticipation was mounting. At their factory in Harlesden, North London, the biscuit makers McVitie's faced the most monumental task of all, baking a wedding cake fit for a princess. Luckily, they had plenty of experience. They'd made their first royal wedding cake for Queen Victoria's grandson, George V, in 1893. And over a century on, they're still turning out royal showstoppers. In 2011, they made Prince William a chocolate groom's cake using 1,700 rich tea biscuits. At any other time, McVitie's would have found building a nine-foot-high, 500-pound fruitcake a, well, let's say, a walk in the park. But in 1947, rationing was even more severe than it had been during the war. All the key ingredients, butter, eggs and sugar, were in very short supply. So donations of ingredients were sent from right across the Commonwealth. We had flour from Canada, butter from New Zealand, sugar from Barbados, rum from Jamaica. But the biggest and perhaps most surprising source of ingredients was actually the Girl Guides of Australia. Growing up, Elizabeth was a keen girl guide. So when her fellow Australian guides heard of her plight, they leapt into action. They saved up their pocket money to buy hundreds of pounds of sugar, flour and crystallised fruit, which were shipped across the world to the McVitie's factory to be transformed into the most enormous cake. This wonderful photograph album reveals just what a spectacle and how enormous the finished cake actually was. It's breathtaking. In fact, it was such a special cake that every night one of the bakers, Jim Allen, slept here in the factory just to keep a watch over it. He knew that come the wedding day, this cake was going to be one of the stars of the show. Now, crazy as it sounds, I can't think of a better way of celebrating the 70th anniversary of the royal wedding than by recreating this fabulous cake, all nine feet and 500 pounds of it. To undertake this colossal challenge, I've enlisted the help of chef Julie Walsh and her team at the Cordon Bleu Cookery School. Julie has over 30 years experience of baking enormous cakes, but even by her standards, this is a pretty tall order. This is definitely the biggest wedding cake I've ever had to produce. <laughs> it towers above everything else in the room. It's huge. <laughs> we had no real measurements. 
we do have a nice picture of, of the cake decorator standing next to it. So we, we kind of use his proportions to work out our estimation of the sizes. Princess Elizabeth requested that the recipe for her cake should remain a closely guarded secret. So all Julie has to work from is the list of ingredients sent to McVitie's by the Girl Guides of Australia. The cake contains 70 pounds of sugar, 60 pounds of sultanas, 30 pounds of butter, and 12 dozen eggs. So far, so standard. But it was dangerously short of one absolutely essential ingredient. The main difference between this fruitcake recipe and, and one of today is that uh, the alcohol content was quite low. It was only one bottle that was donated. So we've slightly increased the quantity to 12 bottles of a mix of rum and brandy. It's not very often that you get to put big gloves like this on and dive into, actually dive into your mix. And I shouldn't have took a deep breath like that because I just had a, inhaled a load of alcohol. <laughs> Chef's purse. <Mm. laughs> on the wedding day, the cake was served to just 150 guests. But it was actually big enough to feed a thousand. If we mess it up here, then that's going to affect the, over <laughs> the overall cooking of the cake batter. But I think we're almost there. Each tier of the cake is so deep that it's impossible to bake them in one go. The outside would burn before the inside was cooked. So Julie is creating an elaborate cake sandwich with each tier made up of three layers stuck together after baking. It's going to take between six and eight hours baking at 150 degrees. Okay, so it's quite a low oven, but they're in. <laughs> it wasn't just the cake that had to meet with royal approval. The bride-to-be's friends and relations faced the always tricky task of picking the perfect wedding present. What do you get the girl who already has it all? From their majesties, the king and queen. A pair of diamond drop earrings. From her majesty, Queen Mary. A diamond bandeau and a diamond ribbon brooch. And a summer brooch in diamonds. A diamond festoon and scroll tiara. But it wasn't all gems the size of gobstoppers. In the past, only people known personally to the royal couple could send gifts. But Philip and Elizabeth broke with tradition and accepted presents from absolutely anybody. There was an amazing array of wedding presents. All sorts of things, from tins of pineapple from the people of Australia through to a beautiful piece of cloth woven by Mahatma Gandhi of India, which when Queen Mary, the grandmother of Princess Elizabeth, saw it, she apparently poked at it with her umbrella and uh, said, what is this? Is it it's Mahatma Gandhi? Oh, is it his loincloth? In the large state rooms are displayed the royal couple's wedding gift. Every gift, from diamonds to doilies, was put on show at St James's Palace. This is a list of all 2,583 presents received by the royal couple. What's so incredibly touching is that most of these come from ordinary people, people who didn't have much, but just wanted to do their bit. Miss C. Handley sent two Pyrex dishes. Mr. and Mrs. Kavanagh sent an automatic potato peeler. I mean, that's just so sophisticated, it's not even in stock these days. And the people of Royal Leamington Spa all clubbed together and sent a washing machine. All mod cons for the up-to-the-minute housewife. But I wonder how many Her Majesty actually got to use. But some of the other presents were quite simply jaw-dropping. In 1947, clothing was still rationed and stockings were amongst the hardest thing to get hold of. So presumably, Princess Elizabeth was delighted with the 148 pairs she received. And if silk stockings seem a slightly intimate present for a future queen, what about this, the handmade lingerie sent in by Miss Lorraine Miller? But I think my favorite of all these slightly inappropriate presents is this, from the Reverend Robert and Mrs Hyde, a bath sponge. Thank you, Reverend.
With the presents sorted and the wedding of the nation's sweethearts just days away, those lucky enough to have an invitation were descending on the capital. Amongst them, a who's who of European royalty. King Michael of Romania reaches London Airport. Each day has seen the arrival of more notable guests who are to be present at Princess Elizabeth's wedding. This was the biggest gathering of European royalty pretty much since the age of Queen Victoria. And they got their tiaras out, they polished them, they got the dresses down from the attic, and they were determined to enjoy themselves. Two nights before the wedding, these royal relations were among 2,000 guests invited to Buckingham Palace for a grand ball. Everybody was in a very jovial mood, obviously, and it was lots and lots of fun. And I think it must have been the king who led the Congo line. And I think it was the Queen of the Netherlands who caught her toe and fell over. We were all part of it. If there's a Congo line, you join it. The party had already started at the palace. But the wedding to-do list was by no means complete. To keep it in perfect condition, the bride's bouquet was left to the last minute. It was made in the early hours of the morning of the wedding. Florist Simon Lysett has done the wedding flowers for everyone, from real royals like Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall, to nearly royals like David and Victoria Beckham. He's using a spectacular array of orchids to recreate Princess Elizabeth's wired wedding bouquet. We take every flower off the natural stem and then we create our own that are then nicely But you cheat. Totally cheating. You cheat, Simon. And it's a very old-fashioned way of creating a bouquet and it's exactly what would have been done at the time. What we do is we pierce through at the back of the flower mm. head Going through the petals. Yeah, in through at the base of the head. So you can see how fiddly and time-consuming as a process yeah, it is. I certainly can. Well, hey, very nice. Um, now, obviously, growing flowers through wartime was an enormous luxury most people didn't have. But I think with the war, with austerity, we hadn't seen much growing other than fruit and veg to feed ourselves. You were reliant upon an assortment of fairly random, slightly ramshackle hothouses that were trying to reboot themselves post-war. But every single flower that was in her bouquet was grown within the British Isles, which... Bearing in mind it was 1947 is a phenomenal achievement because yeah. for me to get these catlias for us today... Where have they come from? These have come from Japan. You are joking. So we've got all our orchids. Um, what about the foliage? What have we got here? This is... It smells beautiful and it's myrtle. And ever since Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Victoria, married with a sprig of myrtle in her bouquet, there has been a bush grown in the gardens at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, and every royal bride has a sprig of myrtle in their bouquet. Princess of Wales? Yes. She'll have had it. Duchess of Cambridge? Yes, indeed. Extraordinary. And that is your bouquet. Look at that. And there's one thing we know about royal weddings, is that they kickstart fashions, you know, the, the dress, the, the colours, the engagement ring, the, all of these things are things everyone else they wants for their weddings. Was it the same for the, for the bouquet? It definitely was, because suddenly the old-fashioned, slightly Victorian technique of a large wired bouquet, very formal, came back into fashion and you can see it filtering down from Princess Elizabeth's wedding and suddenly we had this explosion of the florist's skill and art. It was a great window for us. But as beautiful as the bouquet was, behind the scenes it suffered one of the royal wedding's little-known mishaps. The original bouquet was made by florist Martin Longman. Father would have been nervous. I think anybody would be. The wedding photographs would have shown off the flowers in all their glory. But by the time they came to be taken, the bride's bouquet had vanished. The bridesmaids had theirs, but Princess Elizabeth's was nowhere to be found. And its fate remains a mystery. Soon after the wedding day, father got a call from Buckingham Palace saying that they would, could they make 
a replica of the bouquet. Halfway through their honeymoon, Princess and Prince Philip came back to the palace. She put her wedding dress on again, and he put his naval uniform on, and then they had the photographs, just the two of them. Future royal florists learnt their lesson. For Princess Diana's wedding in 1981, and the Duchess of Cambridge's in 2011, two bouquets were made, just in case. But there could only ever be one nine-foot-high wedding cake. To recreate the royal couple's enormous cake, chef Julie Walsh is at work on its ridiculously elaborate decoration. Julie, I'm getting my head around the scale of this thing. In that tier, we have... There's about 120 kilos in there. So, sorry, I'm just going to digest <laughs> that. Not literally, but that no, is... No. Uh, <laughs> That's a lot. 120 kilos. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, well, cake, icing, marzipan, there is a lot going on. Bottom, and this isn't even the bottom tier. No. And you are no. literally working from photographs. That yes. is, that's all you've got. Yeah. Um, and this is like a sort of interior of a cathedral you're building here out of icing. The cake was decorated with hundreds of separate pieces of delicate lattice work, each of which was painstakingly piped by hand. From the couple's crests and monograms to scenes of royal palaces and pastimes, there's still an awful lot of icing to do. I had absolutely no idea. The amount of work that goes into this, I thought it was just a matter of putting these cakes together and you just decorate them a little bit with a few bits of piping here and there, but it's, it's so much more than that. I almost can't believe that the, the whole thing can come together. It's like someone saying, build a theater out of Nutella. You got three weeks. On the wedding day, the leading lady and her handsome co-star would be centre stage, but their supporting cast also had important roles to play. One of Princess Elizabeth's eight bridesmaids was Pamela Mountbatten, and in 1981, her daughter, India Hicks, followed in her mother's footsteps when she was bridesmaid to Princess Diana. My mother is an exceptional character who takes absolutely everything in her stride. I don't think she would have been surprised or alarmed by any of it. I've never seen this picture before. I love it. It's so informal, which is lovely, because so many of these wedding pictures are very, very formal. Um, and this is just them really laughing together. I remember clearly being asked, and I think the first thing that went through my head was, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to wear a dress. So this is the dress that my mother wore as a bridesmaid to Princess Elizabeth. It's a very fairy tale dress. I love the little tiny flowers that have been, that have been embroidered on. Of course, my mother is far too good-mannered to ever mention that, in fact, being netting it's actually quite a scratchy dress. I did unfortunately get the 1980s, so that is quite a puffball. It was possibly a time in fashion that I didn't necessarily uh, respond to. On the 19th of November, 1947, the eve of Princess Elizabeth and Philip Mountbatten's big day, excitement was building as thousands slept out on the streets to secure the best views of the wedding procession. The rigors of the November night were lightly disregarded by great numbers of people camping all night along the route to make sure of front row places for the marriage procession. As dusk fell the night before the wedding, a crowd gathered outside Buckingham Palace chanting, we want Elizabeth, we want Elizabeth. And the bride-to-be appeared on the balcony and waved and blew kisses to the people below her. She knew how important it was to put on a good show for the crowds. And moreover, she realized that the wedding wasn't just her big day, but the rest of the country's too. And just like today, the press were hungry for every last detail about what was going on behind closed doors. The Daily Express journalist Drusilla Bafus was 19 at the time of the wedding and had just joined the paper. The wedding was a really hot story. We did a feature called Her Day with all the details of the, the narrative of the day on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. 
I mean, we were able to reveal that the princess used a pink lipstick known as Balmoral and that she did her own makeup. Well, we had our sources of information. I shall say no more. <laughs> But now we can reveal for the first time what was really happening inside the palace on the morning of the wedding. Bridesmaid Pamela Mountbatten was on hand to witness the last minute mishaps which can befall even a royal bride. The palaces are run very strictly so that there is a minute by minute um, agenda of who will be where and doing what. But of course, as with any wedding, there is absolute chaos. And my mother very much remembers when the tiara went on, part of the tiara actually snapped and they had to go across London uh, to the jeweler to have it fixed before she could actually put it back on her head again. Just the general normal chaos of what ensues when a bride is getting ready to get married. As Britain held its breath, the wedding that had looked for a while like it might not happen was at last about to begin. And when the Irish state coach set off for Westminster Abbey, the world caught its first glimpse of the bride. When she appeared in the sovereign's coach with her father, the king, she sort of smiled a smile that you just can't fake. And that was just terrific. I was just w aware that I was part of a tremendously important event in the history of this country, and that, to me, was one of the most exciting things. For battered post-war Britain, the sight of all this pomp and pageantry was awe-inspiring. Well, I was in the household cavalry. I was then a 19-year-old. I took part in the escort from Buckingham Palace to the Westminster Abbey. Here we have the escort come up, and I am in the second rank, the first man in. I'm a half canter. It was the first official occasion that we had worn ceremonial uniform, and it, which hadn't been worn since 1939. All the breastplates, everything had to be clean. Boots had to be polished. Everything was top-notch, so that added to the occasion. Well, the crowds were immense, and they were really loud. I can remember that. When she came out the carriage in the abbey, she looked as happy as Larry. Inside the abbey, the groom and 2,000 guests, including a host of foreign royals, waited expectantly. The congregation could virtually hear a pin drop. But outside, you hear the nation going bananas. In the most modern homes, a lucky few followed events on television. We were one of the few families that had a TV, small, black and white. We had it in a hideous walnut cabinet that you opened the doors. Did you have lots of people flocking in? Yes, there was a lot of, you know, cigarette smoking and drinking. And I suppose all the pomp and the pageantry, it's sort of fantastical, it must have felt. Yes. I do remember somebody that talked terribly like this, giving a, 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 a voiceover. In this moment, charged with great meaning, the people of Britain and the Commonwealth join. The organ sounded, and for this hour, Elizabeth is not only a queen to be, but a bride. Right around the world, a staggering 200 million people tuned in for the first ever radio broadcast of a royal wedding service. In his sermon, the Archbishop of York said that the royal wedding service was the same as for any cottager, perhaps marrying that afternoon in a country church in a remote village in the Dales. Of course, with a congregation full of kings and queens and princes and princesses, not to mention a global audience of 200 million, this wasn't quite true. 
Listeners found it a surprisingly intimate and profoundly moving experience, almost as if they were right here in the Abbey with the couple, as they said their I do's. George VI wrote a lovely letter to his daughter afterwards saying how thrilled and proud he was to walk with her on his arm down Westminster Abbey and how he felt when he let go of her at the end, how he was losing something very precious to him. As the newlyweds came down the aisle, the most famous dress in the world was finally revealed in all its splendor. And at the back of the abbey, 19-year-old Barbara Unwin, who had woven the silk for the dress, couldn't wait to see her handiwork. Well, the only thing we could have done was stood on the seats. We looked at one another. No, we better not. <laughs> We'd like to stood up, but we thought, no, better not show ourselves up. We could see the top of their heads, and that's about all. We couldn't see the dress. I only seen it in films, and I would like to have seen it in the flesh, you know. The dress's crowning glory was its 15-foot-long train, embroidered with thousands of seed pearls and crystals. It was carried by the bride's two page boys, one of whom was His Royal Highness Prince Michael of Kent, just five at the time. So far, so good, I think I was thinking. One was fairly preoccupied holding onto the train and uh, the, the responsibility of uh, not getting anything wrong was drummed into one so that you didn't dare let go or scratch your nose. I was particularly interested in the wedding veil, all the marvellous beadwork. And when my mother came back from the abbey, because she had a seat there, the first thing I asked about how was the veil? What did it look like? Did it glitter? And then she said, Prince Michael, who was a little page, tiny, he crunched the veil. And I thought, this is horrifying. And sometimes I look at pictures of Prince Michael and I think, you crunch the veil. Difficult to forgive. <laughs> but the incident seems to have slipped the mind of the guilty party. The whole thing went so smoothly that there was no any one moment of horror where one did anything conspicuously wrong, which has haunted me ever since. As Philip and Elizabeth became husband and wife, the country celebrated a spectacular wedding, pulled off against the odds. But with their public duties done, how would the royals celebrate in private? And will our show-stopping recreation of their wedding cake live up to the original? On the 20th of November, 1947, the whole country was part of Elizabeth and Philip's special day. In London, cheering crowds lined the route back to Buckingham Palace. But this wasn't just a grand public occasion. It was also a private family celebration. And as this rare royal home movie footage reveals, back at the palace, the newlyweds and their friends and relations could finally relax and really enjoy themselves. I've never seen these shots before. Queen Mary, of course, and I think Queen Federica of Greece with her. That's my mother, Princess Marina. It was the first happy, jolly family reunion, I suppose, since the war. I didn't expect 70 years later to see oneself running uncontrolled down the corridor. <laughs> I'm sure it was frowned on by one's elders and betters, but we seem to have got away with it. I think I probably remember the cake the, the sort of thing that the child tends to remember. Look at that wedding cake, it's enormous. And the time has also come to serve up our own recreation of the remarkable royal wedding cake. To celebrate the 70th anniversary of a wedding that not only joined the royal couple, but also brought a whole country together, I've invited the pensioners and staff at the Royal Hospital to join me for a very special tea party. 
I'm laying on tea for over a hundred of the Royal Hospital's resident Chelsea pensioners, many of whom served in the Second World War, and some even attended the wedding in 1947. I just hope they all like fruitcake. There's just one last task for Chef Julie and her team to get the cake assembled. This isn't just an artistic challenge, it's an architectural one. Manoeuvring each tier into position requires pinpoint accuracy. And it must have been just as nerve-wracking for the royal bakers then as it is for us today. I mean, this is just, it's just a series of heart in mouth <laughs> moments, this, isn't it? Last tier. <laughs> Don't make me cry. The flowers have got to be centred, otherwise it's going to tilt. A little bit more, OK. Push it down. Beautiful. The cake is finished in the nick of time. And it looks absolutely spectacular. Just like the original, each tier is decorated with the crests of the bride and groom, with badges showing their military and civilian associations, and with plaques depicting their favourite pastimes. It's so beautiful that it almost seems a shame to eat it. As the royals enjoyed their cake, outside the palace, hundreds of thousands were waiting, desperate for a glimpse of the bride and groom. 14-year-old Antonia Fraser and her school friend Lucy were amongst the crowds. Lucy, my best friend, and I bunked off from school. We were absolutely determined to be there because it was the first glamorous thing either of us remembered. When Princess Elizabeth and her new husband finally appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace, the crowds went wild. We began to run. And that was when the public rushed the gates of the palace, which sounds unbelievable. But there was no sort of security then. War was over, danger was over. I remember being on the balcony, but the crowds were enormous, and the noise they made was fantastic. So there was an enormous feeling of some great event going on, which to anybody, especially to a small child, was an intoxicating thing. They remember shouting, show us the dress, show us the dress. There was really nothing in my life to compare to it. I mean, the whole show was... It was astonishing, really. The wonderful thing about royal weddings is it's a time of rejoicing. It really is pure joy. The Chelsea pensioners have demolished the top tier of the cake. But the three bottom tiers won't go to waste. They'll feed hundreds of people in local nursing homes. I've been waiting to eat this cake for months now. Mmm. <laughs> really good. I better try the icing. I think that was the icing and not my tooth. Ladies and gentlemen, raise your glasses to Her Majesty the Queen. The Queen! As the newlyweds set off on honeymoon, the king, the queen and their bridesmaids waved them on their way. Philip and Elizabeth's marriage had touched the hearts of the nation and given Britain a new sense of hope. And their route to Waterloo Station was lined with cheering crowds. Nobody went home until they'd caught one last glimpse of the happy couple. More than just the royal wedding, it had been the people's wedding. Viva Latino, the all-new X Factor live shows continue at five past seven. It's the girls versus the overs, and Rita Ora is performing live. Tomorrow night, it's the true story of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's romance. Our new documentary, Truly Madly Deeply, is at nine. And next, this afternoon, the latest news where you are. <laughs> <laughs>